Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Marilyn and today I'm very excited because I get to show you a bit of my book collection while doing a twist on a video that I did two weeks ago. So two weeks ago I did a video uh, that was uh, books I admired but did not enjoy. So and then Brian Bookish Texan did a wonderful response video and I'm going to have that down below of books, 10 books that he has admired but didn't enjoy. And I was, I was thinking, well, what books did I, do I admire and enjoy? And then I said, those are the books that I have a collection of. So the first author of the books that I admire and enjoy are books of Barbara Pym. And I do have quite a lot. There are, they're beautiful and I'm gonna show them to you all. I'm reading now, I'm doing a buddy read of The Sweet Dove Died. I just finished it, but I won't talk about it too much. Uh, now, but in the back of the book, it says, few other writers have given me more laughter and more pleasure. And that made me think, that's what I enjoy in reading. Of course, I like to read serious books too. And I have a collection of those. And those maybe I admire, um, but don't really enjoy in the sense that they're enjoyable. They're, they have other qualities about them that um, more intellectual maybe, more political based, or something that's important, but maybe not enjoyable. And I talked about some of the Holocaust books I have that fall into that category. So I read this book with Jack of Spread Book Joy. She's a delight and she was able to explain to me things that I didn't understand about British culture that made this book even more enjoyable, the reserve of British culture. So in this book, The Sweet Dove Died was Barbara Pym's last book. It was published in 1978 and she died in 1980. And it has themes of LBGTQ. Well, uh, I don't, it wasn't called that at that time, but there are gay characters in this book. And it, it, it was, it's a book that you can read over and over again, like all of her books. And I'm gonna show you some of her books. But in this book, we have Leonora, and she's a, more of an ice queen. Uh, she loves beauty, uh, but she never really got to the point where she can get married. And she saw, she kind of falls in love with, uh, with James who happens to be gay and in the closet. So, and um, we meet James and we follow his life of him dating a woman, but always with Leonora until, da da da, I'm not gonna say. So uh, The Sweet Dove Died, um, of course was written by Barbara Pym. And it the, the title is based on uh, uh, John Keats poem I had a dove and the sweet dove died and I have thought it died of grieving oh what could it grieve for its feet were tied with a silken thread of my own hands weaving so she says she repeats this in part of the book and there's also we do terrible things to one another and that is repeated in the book as well. Now I wanted to show you um, this, uh, my collection of Barbara Pym books and the cover illustration, I think it's based on a photograph by Tiana, illustration by Tiana Dunlap. And I think it's a Pan Macmillan book, but I loved even though I don't think it really uh, represents the story as well as it could, it's, it's very 70s and you have two gentlemen sitting, sitting down and, and a woman sitting 
sort of on the edge of the couch and I don't think Leonora would have done that. But let me uh, go through my collection of Barbara Pym novels of books that I enjoyed. And now I think that Barbara Pym is, is like one of my other authors that I admire and enjoy, and that's Jane Austen, because she can make me laugh and you can read it again, as Jack also to said, uh, agreed with, that you can read it again and again and still find things to love about it. So here's No Fond Return of Love, and it says one of her best comic, heartrending, brave, in short, like life itself. And uh, she has a unique eye and ear for the small poignancies and comedies of everyday life. Her novels are miniatures, perhaps, but will not diminish. And that was her friend Philip, Philip Larkin, uh, who uh, I read a few books by him, and he was also a poet, but he wrote nonfiction. And I did read a book by him, but I can't think of it right now. So Dulce Manwaring is also helping, is always helping others, but never looks out for herself, especially in the realm of love. And that's all I'll say. But um, the cover is, I love this cover. <laughs> and it reminded me a little bit of something that I read about Barbara Pym when she was younger, that she, she sort of uh, stalked her uh, she did a little stalking of the uh, boys that she liked when she went to college and she just happened to be there when when uh, they appeared and this kind of looks like that to me um, another book a glass of blessings I love this book I read all of these books by the way and uh, this is about Wilmot Forsyth well-dressed well looked after suitably husbanded good-looking and fairly young, but very bored. Her sober husband, Rodney, who, now I didn't know Wilmot was her girl's name at first, uh, who works at the ministry, is slightly bolder and fatter than he once was. Wilmot would like to think she has changed rather less. I don't remember, that's what's so great about Barbara Pym. You know, you go into it and then you remember, but there's still so much more to glean from it. And one of my favorites is Quartet in Autumn. And uh, she wrote this book uh, in the 70s. It's deliciously blackly funny and full of obstinate optimism. And she sh it, the, Quartet in Autumn shows Barbara Pym's sensitive artistry at its most sparkling. And we see beautiful autumn colors in this book. And uh, one did not drink sherry before the evening, just as one did not read a novel in the morning. <laughs> so in 1970s London, Edwin, Norman, Letty, and Marcia, or Marcia, work in the same office and suffer the same problems, loneliness. And this is kind of about this quartet of people aging in a newly, uh, a newly, London, a new London that they can't understand. Uh, the kids, they can't understand them. And uh, I don't know if this is like based on the 60s more than the 70s, you know, the hip London vibe, but I know I loved it. And Jack told me that she loved it too. Uh, and then we have some Tame Gazelle, which is one of the first books I think I read of Barbara Pym. And uh, Together Yet Alone, the Mrs. Bede occupied the central crossroads of parish life. Harriet, plump, elegant, and jolly, likes nothing better than to make a fuss of new curates. I hope I'm saying it right, curate, uh, like the vicars. And jolly, like nothing better, okay. And uh, securing the knowledge that Count Ricardo Bianco will propose to her again this year. Belinda, meanwhile, has harbored sober feelings of devotion toward Archdeacon Hotch Lee for 30 years. And this is a little bit meatier, and I remember loving it. And the um, they're at a what they used to call a jumble sale, and this shows this really lovely. And then we have, of course, Jane and Prudence, and uh, Jane and Prud Prudence is Jane Cleveland and Prudence Bates 
seem an unlikely pair to be walking together at an Oxford reunion. Neither of them is aware of it. They couldn't be more different. So these are two friends. And of course, there's excellent women that I don't have to talk much about, except that it's the most famous of Barbara Pym's novel. And I just did a reread of this with Freddie uh, from Sluggish Reader, and we had a lot of fun reading it. I gave it five stars. First time I read it, I gave it four and a half. But reading it again, I got so much more out of it, and that's what's so special about Barbara Pym. So um, I haven't, I think I've read all of Barbara Pym's major novels, but I haven't collected all of them in these beautiful covers. So Barbara, why is Barbara Pym one of the authors and uh, her books are to be collected? It's because really she makes me happy. And that's so important. If an author can make me laugh and then I read it again and there's a, something else sarcastic and I laugh again or I laugh out loud, that's an author that's witty, that has something to say, that um, talks about something uh, in most of her books that I wasn't aware of, and that was the, the, the Church of England, and uh, the high church, the low church, the vicars, the curates. Um, a new world opens up for me. So that comes uh, to my second choice of books. And of course, that's Jane Austen. And Barbara Pym has been compared to Jane Austen for the same reasons. And um, I don't have beautiful covers to these books yet. <laughs> I want to. Um, and these are the Oxford World Classics. And I think my favorite Jane Austen is Persuasion. And I read it last year for Jane Austen July. I just love this book. We, sh we show a character that is a little older than most of um, Jane Austen's characters, and uh, the ending just tore me. It really tore me apart. I loved it so much. And uh, Emma is one that I haven't read recently, and I think I'm going to read this Jane Austen July. And then we have my favorite. It keeps on changing between um, between persuasion and uh, and this one, Pride and Prejudice. I love Pride and Prejudice. I love it so much. And what can I say about Pride and Prejudice? It's it's just perfect. And then we have North Aber North Anger Abbey that I didn't like as much as the other books. And this was her last book. I thought it would be her first book because uh, the character was younger. So. I don't know why I thought it might be her first book, but I still enjoyed it. There's no, no Jane Austen that I don't like. And here I have Lady Susan that I'm going to read along with another book for Jane Austen July. And this is a beautiful cover. And this also has the Watson Sandition and the Complete Juvenalia. And I love this cover so much. And I will say, why do I love Jane Austen so much? Why does, how did I get into Jane Austen? And I was very fortunate to get into Jane Austen in my 30s because I read an article in, the, in, an, in a magazine. Magazines were very important to me uh, in my 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, they were usually cheaper than books at that time. Now they're more expensive. And not only that, were they cheaper than books, but they gave you articles that you can finish. And when you have four children, you want an article you can just finish and then take care of your kids and come back to it. And I read an article that said, if you're feeling down, read a Jane Austen book. I had never heard of Jane Austen, but I started reading her and I couldn't stop. And then when I joined BookTube four years ago, I was reintroduced by Jane Austen July. So that's my second book, second author and books that I collect of books that I enjoy and I admire so much. Jane Austen was a genius in my, in my opinion. So if you love Jane Austen, let me know down below which one of her books is your favorite. Now, the third author that I will talk about is Agatha Christie. 
And I have a whole collection of Agatha Christie books. I love mysteries. I love good mysteries. I love wonderful stories as well as good plots. And I picked these three out because in the 70s, Agatha Christie was asked, what are your favorite books of all the books you read? And these are three of, I think, 10 of her favorite books. Now, I read somewhere that Agatha Christie was, is the most read novelist beside the Bible. I don't know if this is still true, but um, it says two, million cop two billion copies of her books in print, the most popular mystery writer of all time, as well as the world's best-selling author. And she received the Britain's highest honor where she was made Dame of the British Empire. So on her list was Death on the Nile. Now, I don't think you have to know what Death on the Nile is about, but I recently talked about uh, a new uh, adaptation of it that I couldn't remember who done it, even though I read this so many times. The, the, the adaptation was done so well. It's the last one that was done. And I, it was just, I was just watching it like I never saw the book, just read the book. But this was one of her favorite books, as well as one of my favorites, Endless Night, which has that 60s vibe that I always talk about. And of course, her masterpiece, And Then There Were None. That, uh, that other authors have repeated and repeated and repeated because it was such a original and complex plot. And it says here that perhaps the greatest mystery novel of all time, and then there were none, is Agatha Christie's acclaimed masterpiece of murder and suspense. Ten strangers are gathered together on an isolated island by a mysterious host, one by one, the guests share the darkest secrets of their wicked pasts, and one by one they die. And that was a scare. I wanted the scary cover, so I got this one, which was one of many, many covers. So there's not much I can say about Agatha Christie, but that she loved that these were her fate three of her favorite books makes me want to read them over and over again and collect them and I have a big collection. Now let me get to some authors that are not as popular as these three that I talked about. So my fourth um, my fourth novelist and books is Betty Smith who happens to come from the same Brooklyn neighborhood that I was raised in maybe 50 years prior to when I was there. And I'm not going to even show you, I have a copy, uh, anniversary copy of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. So right away, you know that, that name of the book. But a lot of people don't know that Betty Smith also wrote other books, uh, maybe five other books. And I've read all of her books. What I like to do when I love a book is get all of the author's books that they ever wrote and read them all. And sometimes I'm disappointed, and sometimes I'm not. But with Betty Smith, I have never been disappointed. So I'm not going to talk about A Tree Grows in Brooklyn today, but I will talk about some uh, books in my collection. And this is Betty Smith's book. It's very old, and maybe one day I'll get a new copy. But it was my favorite after A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and it's Tomorrow Will Be Better. And you can get this on Kindle, but I, I kind of want, wanted to get a hard copy of this because it's hard to get. And um, it is a similar book as A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Now, let me just tell you that Bo Betty Smith said that all her novels were autobiographical in nature, either in different times of her life or it's sort of autofiction, but they didn't use that term. And in this uh, book, we have Margie. She doesn't get along with her mother. In a lot of the, her books, she doesn't get along with her mother, the, uh, even in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. 
and this is such a rich book I don't want to spoil it for anybody but it shows how life was for a particular class of people that were brought up in Brooklyn where the tree grows in Brooklyn and how they went about their lives when they became teenagers when they went to dances when they uh, the way they spoke it's just a wonderful book so if you've read it tomorrow will be better let me know in the comments if you loved it as much as I did now a book I didn't like as much is Maggie now and this is another Betty Smith novel and so a tree grows in Brooklyn was her first novel but um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Betty Smith so so when she wrote a tree grows in Brooklyn she was able to make a little money and what she did was she remodeled a 150 year old home in Chapel Hill set in two acres of lawn garden and 200 year old oak trees in North Carolina then she lives some of the time for when the writing urge comes on her she retires to a remote cottage on the coast of North Carolina and she also um, she went to uh, a college when she even before that and uh, she studied at the Yale Drama School under George P Baker and wrote and published 71 act one act 71 act plays and she was sent to the University of North Carolina that's how she ended up there to write regional plays and decided to make Chapel Hill her home and that's where she wrote A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And uh, so she once said, Brooklyn is a town of dark mystery and violent passion and gentle ways. There are astonishing customs and rituals of living hidden away from the outsider and only known to Brooklyn people or Brooklynites as we used to call them when I was growing up. That was the Brooklyn of Francie and a tree grows in Brooklyn. It is the Brooklyn of Maggie now and also of the book of um, Margie in Tomorrow Will Be Better. So this was Maggie now and this is a story of Maggie now who grew up with the green young century among the immigrant Irish and Germans of Brooklyn. Maggie now is one of the givers of the world and inevitably she attracted leaners as a post attracts Ivy. And we talk that there's about her father. He was a character, Patrick Dennis, who had been the best jigger and the highest leper in County Kilkenny until he fled Ireland too easily talked out of marrying his true love by a selfish mother. And in Brooklyn, he marries another woman. It's, now that I'm, I'm remembering it, I like this book too, just not as much as Tomorrow Will Be Better. Then when, um, when I was in my 20s, I read Joy in the Morning. And this is also autobiographical. And it's about a couple that meet in Brooklyn and 1927 Brooklyn. Carl Brown and Annie McGarry meet and fall in love. Though only 18, Annie travels alone halfway across the country to the Midwestern University where Carl is studying law, and there, they're ma marry, and there they marry. But their first year together is much more difficult than they expected. In a faraway place with little money and few friends, with hardship and poverty weighing heavily upon them, Annie and Carl come to realize that their greatest source of strength, loyalty, and love will help them make it through. And Joy in the Morning, I think, is a Bible verse. Um, yeah, it's a Psalm 30.5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Now, Betty Smith also got married very young and went with her husband to a mid Midwestern University where she took classes um, there. So, th like I said, this is a wonderful book too. I loved it when I was in my 20s. So, please pick up this book. Now, the last book. The last book is not, is a very 
uncommon author. I never knew of her until I joined BookTube. And I think that I became familiar with her through a Lil of Lil's Vintage World, who reads wonderful um, English novels uh, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. <laughs> and uh, the first, she was talking about this novel, Our Spoons Came From Woolworths by Barbara Cummins. Barbara Cummins is an English author. Uh, and as I talked about this before, I'm not going to talk about it again. It's in introduced by Maggie O'Farrell, who many people know. And I love this book so much. It's my favorite of all her books. Um, she's pretty, unworldly. Sophia is 21 and hastily married to Charles, a young painter. Now, in real life, Barbara Cummins was the same married to a young painter, an artist's model with an eccentric collection of pets. She is ill-equipped to cope with 1930s Bohemian London, where poverty babies, however much loved and husband, conspire to torment her. And I talked about this last, I want to read this again and again and again. And she is an author like no other. She does a little magical realism. She makes you laugh. She makes you cry. Please give her a try. And, um, I read The House of Dolls, uh, didn't like it as much, but still appreciated it. It's um, about four ladies who live upstairs at Mulberry Grove, remember better days of parties and servants when rent was something to be collected, or that's what they pretend. Nowadays, they remember the rent only too well, but with the help of a little makeshift prostitution, the wages of sin is security. <laughs> that it's... It's, it's very unusual. These women are quite old. And um, some elderly ladies ply an older profession. And I didn't like this as much. This was written, uh, it was published in 1989 in, in Great Britain. And um, I'm not sure if it even came to America. And here's the, the cover. And we have like a falling asleep uh, elderly man with his pigeon toes and a very elderly woman with, yeah, a bra, <laughs> in a bra. So it might not be for everyone, let's put it that way. Um, the Vet's Daughter was great. This had magical realism in it. And uh, Alan Hollingshurst, whoever he is, says it's a wonderful and original novel. It's a small Gothic masterpiece, Sarah Waters said. I have read it many times, and with every reread, I marvel again at its many qualities, its darkness, its strangeness, its humor, its sadness, its startling images and twists of phrase. And that's what's so amazing about Barbara Cummins, is that she's so original that she can make me like magical realism when it's done the way this is done. And... Um, there's a picture of her over here. There's not many pictures of her that I was able to find. But she was born in 1909 in Bidford on Avon. And she was educated mainly by governesses until she went to art school. And she was married first in 1931 to an artist and for the second time in 1945. And she wrote Sisters by a River, which I haven't read yet. Our Spoons Came From Woolworths, Who Was Changed and Who Was Dead, which I think I just bought, um, The House of Dolls, Mr. Fox, The Juniper Tree, which, is this The Juniper Tree? Uh, no, this is, I have, two co I have two copies of The House of Dolls, but I do have a copy of The Juniper Tree, which was a, um, it was a retelling of Beauty and the Beast, and I quite like that book. So I still have more books to read by her and that's what's so exciting so those are the five authors and books in my collection i loved i enjoyed and i can continue rereading these books like forever so um please tell me down in the comments do you have books that you love enjoy collect because they're rereadable, they're, they bring you joy. 
because all of these books have brought me joy in my life. So until we meet again, and next month, May, is Mental Health May, so I will be back. I am going on vacation in the middle of May, and uh, I'm going to be seeing a good friend, a booktube friend, Lindy, from Lindy's Magpie Reads, and I'm so excited. Plus, I'm traveling with my daughter, and that's always a thrill sometimes, but we like to eat good food, and we like to look at beautiful scenery, so it's nice to have a daughter who lives with you, not that you live with them, not that there's anything wrong with that. So um, I hope that you will tell me what you think in the comments, and please like, subscribe, and push the notification bell. I really would appreciate it. It would help the algorithm, schmalgorithm, whatever, take you to my videos when they come out. So I'll leave you today with a big aloha. Bye.